Thank you for joining me for this week's segment of Tuesday Talks with the Maestro. I'm Ken Andrews, founder, music director, and conductor for the Orchestra of Northern New York. And I'm here with my very special guest for this week, Jennifer Kessler. Uh, Jen is not only assistant concertmaster for the Orchestra of Northern New York, she's professor of music education at the Crane School of Music and a member of the Carriage House Quartet, as well as being concertmaster for the Northern Lights Orchestra, and so many more things. And if you go on our website, you'll be able to see her bio and all the wonderful things that she's been doing in her career at Ani.org. Uh, thank you for being here, Jennifer. My so pleasure. Much. Thank you for being here. I just want to ask, before we talk about the orchestra a little bit, I'm curious about your background. Um, was violin the first instrument that you started with? Violin was not the first instrument I started with. When I was very young, I started on piano. Uh, my mother is a pianist, and I think that's how that began. How old were you when you started piano? Oh, I'm going to say seven or eight, something like that. There used to be an old music store I grew up in Potsdam called Calipari's, and that's where mm -hmm. I was taking lessons. And then my mother tried to teach me, but that was uh, pretty rough. So <laughs> <laughs> that didn't end well. They always say that parents teaching their own kids on it can, can be tough. Um, and so when did you decide to uh, take up violin? Or was violin the first string instrument that you started with? I, I started violin at 11, which is sort of late, I guess. Um, but I started the violin because when I was 11, I transferred to a public school, the public school system. I had gone to a Catholic school um, for six years, and I found out that they offered instrumental lessons in the middle school where I was going to attend. And where was this? Man? Potsdam. Oh, right. This was in Potsdam. Was in Potsdam. Right. And a long time before that, probably when I was four, a family member had given us a violin um, that sort of sat in the attic. And when it was time to choose a string instrument, that's what I chose. And we pulled the one down that was sitting around, and it was the uh, accurate size at the time. And the rest is history. Wow. And I took to it. I loved it. Fantastic. You know, I know you play a lot of viola as well. Um, and some, a, a lot of teachers try to get violinists to, to learn viola so that they can sort of switch hit if they need to, especially for jobs and various different aspects. But I'm just, uh, but you, you play it particularly well. And I know many times uh, over the years when the Orchestra of New York, when we had an, a vacancy that, we, that came up, you were gracious enough to offer to, to go over there, even also as principal, guest principal viola as well. I'm just curious, maybe our listeners might be curious, what, what are the biggest differences you find you have to do when you switch from violin to viola, or vice versa? Right, well, the, thank you for the opportunity, by the way. I, I wish I had played it a little bit more, but I have fond memories of playing, uh, particularly for I those Baroque concerts that Ani, that Ani did, player. or still does. Um, it's played similarly. Um, the biggest difference is it's, it's larger in size, and it has a more rich, deeper range than the violin, and that's because um, of the C string. Strings are a little bit thicker, but it's a really nice change to play uh, both instruments, you know. Do you find the difference in size? Does it take you very long to adjust to that? Um, or do it, you find it, for most violin, do you find that you do it because you, do you think it works only if you do it a lot, or do you find it difficult if? I don't find it difficult, and I don't, I'm not sure right now what size my own viola is, but it's probably not the biggest one I could buy, so it's very, it's very adaptable, and I have an easy time playing it, but mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. Uh, you've been uh, not only in, helped us in different parts of the section, because as, as we know, every stand has its own value. It, it it's all has different leadership roles, mm -hmm. and I, I know in your career you've, you've sat in many of those different situations, and you've been gracious to do that with us. But you've also been a guest concertmaster with us, and now you're our assistant concertmaster. But I'm curious about those two roles. What do you find different when you sit in the assistant concertmaster position, and when you slide over into the concertmaster position? What changes here, and what do you feel changes in, in how you uh, handle that position? Hmm, that's a very interesting question. When I sit concertmaster for SLU Orchestra, for instance, um, the leadership that's necessary to know your music well, to be an overt cure for the rest of the section is really apparent. And I find that when I sit assistant concertmaster next to John, there is a tendency that you have to maintain playing under, still maintaining that leadership for the back of the section, and just kind of gelling with that inner circle of, of colleagues up front. Um, both, both Positions are very important and very interesting, and they come with their challenges. So. Yeah. 
Oh, I was very disappointed when we had to cancel our oh, Harry no. Potter concerts, unfortunately. Um, I, our Star Wars our concert, Star Wars, excuse me, concert, Star Wars yeah. Harry Potter last year, but I was very sorry because uh, Jen was going to be our concert master for the Star Wars, but we will do that again. <laughs> we will do it again. Um, I'm curious, you also are a member of a string quartet, the Carriage, House, Carriage mm -hmm. House Quartet. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm first curious about is what do you find, because I know you do a lot of chamber music. I've been fortunate enough to hear you play in different places around the North Country. And it, one of the things about Jen that's so special, I always find, is her sound. It's <laughs> so amazing. It's such a rich, full sound. And it lends itself so well to chamber settings and orchestral settings. But I'm curious, how do you feel that the chamber music work affects your orchestral playing or vice versa? Well, both, both roles involve, you know, really astute, close listening, no matter what, who you're playing with, what you're playing, or what the, what the uh, particular orientation is. Um, I enjoy both a lot. I love being in the middle of a giant wall of sound, as we are in orchestras, um, being a part of many, many colleagues making music together. But I also love the, the kind of autonomy that comes with a chamber music group, um, being able to be responsible for your own part, um, making interpretive decisions, um, collaborating with one other person on that part on how you can create the, the most you know, beautiful uh, rendition of whatever it is you're playing. So they both, they both are really special uh, context and I yeah I don't have a favorite but I, I think they both lend themselves to one another. That group I think all the members of that quartet are members of the orchestra. We in are. New York. I'm sure you've had people come in and sit in from other mm -hmm. work as mm -hmm. well. But, um, yeah it's a it's a very nice thing to be able to do uh, to have the, your group in common and to have this you know offshoot uh, mm -hmm. to make music. Do you see this group uh, and are you looking for specific uh, types of playing to do as far as school in schools or uh, full concerts, or what, what, what do you see for the future for this quartet? I don't know if we're looking for anything specific per se, but we are open to any kind of opportunity. And we've been fortunate to uh, be part of the um, Marigold Bakery series. We, ha we have um, planned different weddings. We have one later on this month, and I think educational opportunities would be fantastic. Um, so I think we're open to whatever our, you know, wherever our path leads us. Mm -hmm. I, when you mention the word educational, it, it, I wanted to mention that you do so much within the music education department at Crane. And I'm curious, um, what do you see for the role in the future of young orchestras, such as junior high or, or grade school orchestras or high school orchestras? Because we hear so many things about you know, schools going to other kinds of ensembles. And, in, in the wake of what's been happening? Yeah. Well, in the wake of what's been happening, number one, and also because some people want to see uh, more ethnic varieties of groups. Oh, sure, and I, and I yeah. think that's important for us, uh, particularly in this time in our lives, to be more open to different ways of music making um, in different genres. And yeah, and, and I think you know maintaining tradition is great, but also breaking down boundaries and thinking outside the box as far as music making opportunities, and not just for you know professional musicians like us, but to give those opportunities to kids who are in school, to show them that the field of music is broader than what it's currently been. Yeah. I'm curious, are there any, um, when you're doing uh, orchestral work, are there any particular composers that um, you are that you gravitate. I know you love all music, <laughs> and it's always tough to ask any musician this. But I'm curious: are there any particular composers in terms of orchestral music that you find yourself that you gravitate? I, for some reason, have been partial to English composers: Rayvon Williams, Holst. So uh, yes, and I also I, I like French Poulenc. I like um, Ravel. So I don't know. I just. I also don't find myself necessarily drawn to a particular composer, but, oh, I like this piece by this person, and so there's sort of no rhyme or reason with that. Um, and, you know, bucket list pieces, we all have them. Scheherazade was one, so that kind of crossed that off. Well, I'm hoping we'll do that again. We did it a few years ago, and I'm, it's, it's uh, been a while now, so I'd be a Oh, great, it has, it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. Be yeah. a great piece to bring back. Yeah. Um, and such great string writing. Anything, oh, I know. Of course, anything with the Russian composers is mm -hmm. so, so wonderful. Um, I'm curious, are there any, um, particularly you've played so many concerts with us, mm -hmm. uh, so many concerts with so many groups, but <laughs> with the Orchestra of Northern New York, um, are there any 
particular moments or concerts or pieces that, that bring back a special memory? Um, yes. I think I am drawn instantly, um, in answer to that question, to the string programs. So there haven't been that many of them, so I really like it's it's something that is very memorable to me. There was I'm probably going to reference two separate concerts, but Dvorak, uh, Serenade for Strings, Elgar, Simple Symphony, Britain, um, a movement from the Mendelssohn Octet, where we all stood and played. I really love playing string music. And the Thomas As well Talos, as full orchestra. Oh, that's the, the that's the ultimate bucket list, yes. yes. And we've done that. So I would look forward to more of those opportunities. And I think probably my, my favorite concert is the Baroque every year. I really love the whole atmosphere, winter, crowding the church. I, I just love the music, too. Yeah. Well, we're, we're certainly intimate. in our new series this next year, hoping that Baroque concert will be able to be played. And with, uh, we're, with all that's going on in the world today, mm -hmm. we're trying our best to do it. And uh, it has quite a, a wonderful mix. Um, I think that's great. Are there any uh, pieces within your chamber uh, writing that you particularly are drawn to, and, or composers for chamber writing? Um, we are in the process in the quartet. We're playing a lot of tangos. We are fortunate to have Erin Brooks with us, who is a music historian. So she's always pulling in music and sort of telling us the story of, um, you know, behind, behind the composition, behind the composer. So we've been reading a lot of tangos, and she brought in Borodine to read the other day. So I said, we got to read this. It's one of my favorites, too. So. So I guess I like Russian composers. Well, I, I want to thank you for not only all of your years with the orchestra, such, such a consummate musician, not, in, not only in terms of being a violinist, but as being a, a musician, more importantly, and what you've brought to the orchestra and what you've brought to this region in terms of for children with all your work with music education and Crane Youth Music mm -hmm. and everything else. It's been just great, and I always consider it an honor to have you in, when, in the orchestra when we're, when we're working together. Likewise, so it's great. a pleasure to thank be here. Thank you for joining thank us Thank you. Thanks. And I want to thank our listeners for joining us this week for Tuesday Talks with the Maestro. Please join us again next week as we'll put another segment uh, together, and uh, I hope all of you will stay safe and healthy. Thanks again. See you next week.